committee meeting. Um, we have a really nice agenda this evening. We'll start off with public input. Is there any public input that's not on the agenda this evening? Still looking. Seeing none, we'll continue right on. We're going to go a little out of order. We have some great guests tonight. The first guests are Mr. Tom Connery and Mr. Cyril McWeeny from the Friends of Reading Football. Good evening. Good evening. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. You guys usually come with good news, so yes, that's why I moved you up news. in the agenda. We're planning for a winning 2015 football season. That's good news. Um, we're hoping for a solution about clearing the fall before the, uh, the field before the start of the season. <laughs> or lacrosse. But maybe lacrosse will solve that problem for us. <laughs> uh, on behalf of the Friends of Reading Football, uh, we are making a donation to uh, the school district of 10 stadium flags <clears throat> that are to replace the old Middlesex League flags that fly on the top of the uh, stadium of the bleachers. And so on behalf of the class of 2015, this is an in-like-kind donation of $2,500, and we're here to present those flags to you. So, <clears throat> we're pretty proud of how they came. Local money, local businesses, William Blanchard Oops, over, sorry, in, no. over in uh, Wakefield. And the flags are double-sided. Nice. Uh, the color white was selected on the recommendation of Blanchard so that they were <clears throat> clear both during the daytime against the blue sky and nighttime against the dark sky. Awesome. Are these, are for, these are for any sport right. play of the field, not just football. And you mentioned that they were to replace the existing Middlesex League flags that are out. Is, is it all Reading across, no. Tom, or is it one yeah. for each team in the Middlesex League? Uh, in the former Middlesex League, correct. Okay, and it'll be on that same white background? Just curious. No, all the flags that we're donating are Reading Rock. Oh, oh, I understand, I understand. All the same. Thank you. All I'm sorry, I just caught up with you. Do you mean that there's one at each of our neighborhood fields? No, okay. there are 10 ah. flags that fly across the top of the stadium. And they're There's all? There's 10 flag awesome. holders, and <clears throat> each flag holder formerly had represented um, the Middlesex old League Middlesex. School. The old Middlesex the League. Middlesex the League. old Middlesex League. Thank you. Sorry for those silly questions. Mr. Robinson? So, yeah, that actually, I just had a question along those lines. Uh, so I, sometimes when you go to... Uh, other towns in their gyms, I see it a lot. You'll see, so that we're we're not in a we're not in the middle. Liberty is it the Liberty Division or do we not fly those anymore? No. So the league is. We are now in the uh, in the Liberty Division, but it is uh, loosely comprised of a group of schools that changes from season to season depending upon the ranking. Some of the schools remain the same, but it's not that steady state mm -hmm. Middlesex League anymore. Right. So as we collaborated on what we typically do in donating uh, a gift annually from our club that benefits the school in total, this was an idea that was brought forward by the class of 2015. And uh, we liked it. We had to perfect the logo. Um, and uh, we had to go through a couple of iterations of what the Reading R looked like um, so that it didn't look like an amoeba. <laughs> And, uh, and this is the donation. Great. Dr. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I just had a question. Do the flags come down? Every game. <clears throat> Every game the flags come down. They're rolled on the pole, and they're stored up in the press box. Great. So they are readily available any time that the press box is open for any team, any school, any field participant to, to use. <coughs> or for the, much. Or for the athletic director to, you know, so direct. Mr. Robinson, do we have a motion? <coughs> we do. <coughs> uh, move to accept the donation in the amount of, uh, for, excuse me, move to accept the donation from Friends of Reading Football in the amount of $2,500 to be used to purchase stadium flags. Is there a second? Second. Further discussion? I just wanted to say that I think it's great that they, the idea came from the kids and that the adults listened and made it a reality. All those in favor of the motion, motion carries, carries 6-0. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you for you. everything you guys did. not done. Oh, goodness. <laughs> uh, in addition, we are uh, donating to the school committee uh, a stipend in the amount of $1,400 for Coach De Benedictus, who assists the football team uh, during the 2014-15 
2014 season. That's already you approved that. that yeah. You approved that last. Yeah. We approved last that already. Week. But <laughs> thank you again. But thank you. Very well. Okay, we're all done. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you Tom. Thanks, Thanks so much. much. Appreciate it. Thanks, Tom. We will go with uh, our reports this evening. Ms. Nastry. Um, yeah, so this weekend at RMHS was a very eventful weekend. Um, we had the RMHS Drama Club nice? presented Antigone. It was a very decent turnout, and um, it was a very stylized play, very different from anything we've done before. And our next play is the first weekend of May, which will be Sleepy Hollow. Um, another thing is the girls' hockey team is going to the state championships. Uh, they will be playing against Foxborough at the Garden this upcoming Sunday, I believe. I believe it's Sunday. So that's very exciting news for the hockey team. And um, also the Robotics Club had an event here at high school. Ms. Well. Nastry, thank you. Yeah. Thank Picking you. up on that theme of the Robotics Club, Mrs. <laughs> Webb, we were waiting for you. We can't wait to hear thank about you. it. Do we, do, were we able to get any electronic uh, stuff going or no? Um, no? We well we have, but it was set up for Parker right now. Oh, okay. I okay. thought you were doing reports after Parker was. Oh, you know what? I'm sorry, Dr. Doherty. I had a little coffee before I came, and so I've been a little. Off. <laughs> Mrs. Webb, would you mind holding on that report? Not at all. Okay, because I I know several of us were able to go this weekend and are kind of looking forward to your report. Yeah, excellent. I'd like to hold reports if that's okay. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Lyons. Welcome. We're going to get started with the Parker presentation so that we don't keep you guys any longer. Great. Get you another coffee. <laughs> exactly. So first off, thank you very much for having us. Um, we have four teachers with us this evening. We have representation from both seventh grade teams. We have team leader Chris Toomey, along with Mrs. Matrano, who will be talking about the work that they're doing. Um, and we also have Ms. Costa, who's a seventh grade team leader, and Mr. Spinelli, who's a seventh grade English teacher. Can, so, the can I, can I, can I, who was who? <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. I'm Chris Toomey. Okay. Jane Costa. Andrew Spinelli. Julie Machado. Great. Welcome. Sorry. No worries. <laughs> no worries. So, the, the presentation this evening is, is focused on behavioral health, more specifically, tiered systems of support. And so, the, you know, the district's commitment to behavioral health and creating supports for students around academics, behavior, and social-emotional needs has, has really never been greater. And so the work that you're, you're hearing about this evening is aligned with the district goals, our school improvement goals, and it's also directly related to what students need at the school level. So, so this process, is it comes in, in play or comes about by how teachers create goals, student learning goals and professional practice goals, which are related to their educator growth plans and the teacher evaluation system. So it's part of that. But we start this process in the spring where we dialogue, the administrators dialogue with teachers, and we talk about you know, if we are creating interventions or supports for kids, what do you feel like is most important or what do you feel like you can create at the team level? And so, and I say at the team level because their professional practice goal and sometimes student learning goals are created but with a cohort of teachers. So everyone has, a, anyone, everyone contributes to the goal. And the idea of creating a cohort of teachers working on the same goal also creates some consistency and continuity by the supports we create for kids. And you'll hear more about that as they go through this. But as, as we, so that process starts in the spring and then when they draft educator growth plans in the, in the fall, it contributes and you'll see what the teachers have created here. We're also learning that by creating these goals and having it relate to and, and creating a through line through the district goals and the school improvement goals that there's a connection not only to what we're writing at the district level in terms of leadership, but also in terms of what we hope that it can look like and how and who it can affect in terms of the students actually sitting in the seats. So I will let the teachers talk more about this. And so I'd like to turn it over to team leader Chris Toomey. All right, so um, like Ms. Lyons said, we, um, this year we, um, our goal was to focus on uh, the students using the tiered system of support 
And um, this year, our goal kind of evolved over time. We started out by using focal students and identifying what kids' needs were, so social, emotional, uh, behavior, academic. And so we started out by identifying certain students, and we we're going to keep track of, of certain data along the way. And one thing we, that happened over time was that we um, noticed that there were, there, were, there were more kids than just our focal students, obviously. And so we created something um, called Office Hours, which is it's nothing uh, mind-blowing, but it's a place for, for kids to come after school. And so the way we did it, uh, there's been different systems in place over time with, uh, you know, like homework clubs and detention and all these other names. And so the office hours was a, a team um, system in which um, each of us, um, the four people on the team, myself, Julie, um, Jake Barnett, and Jen Gray, each take a day. And this was um, to provide a, a few things here. First of all, consistency um, throughout the day and throughout the week because a lot because a lot of times students didn't know who was there or where they could go and so by each of us um, taking a day that provided a consistency um, this is also to support kids that need help um, that provides accountability as well holds students accountable for their work and then on, um, lastly it's so that students can take ownership of their own learning so what it is it's basically every day one of us um, is always here after school from 2.30 to 3.30, and all the students know uh, what days that we have. So we have something that's hung up in, <coughs> excuse me, every classroom. All the kids definitely at this point know this system, I think, by heart. Most of the parents do, too, at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just a place, again, just to echo what Chris was saying, it's just consistent so that the kids know that every Monday that Mr. Toomey is going to be in his room after school from 2.30 to 3.30, and they have a place that they can go to get some extra support, to ask some questions. Um, and just to get some work done. Great. Excuse me. Mr. Rogers. Just, uh, just a question. So how did you decide it was going to be after school as opposed to before school? I'm just curious. Um, I think it was just uh, the time worked out best for most of the teachers and students. Um, there are some kids, you know, that, that do come in early for, for various reasons, and, and usually one of us is there. But this is a more, this model is, is consistent so that students know that there's always a place to go um, each day of the week. So we have it um, where the kids are welcome to come even if it's, um, you know, if they don't know anything, if it's just I, I have play practice at, you know, such and such a time, I want to spend 20 minutes after school getting some homework done. Um, they can come in, you know, knowing which room that, that's open for the day and they can work on any you know help that they might need for an assignment help studying for a test if they have a partner assignment in science class they can meet up with their partner and um, have a place where they can work make up tests and quizzes um, and also we have a couple students where sometimes technology can be iffy at home and they know that they can use the iPad carts and the laptops and we can print things for them if they need to things like that Okay, for, the, for accountability, I mean, this, for kids that are, are consistently uh, missing work and um, late for assignments or, like Julie said, don't have the technology at home, um, this is a way for us to hold them accountable. So students that don't have the work um, in class um, will be asked to come to office hours. And by now, you know, it took a little while to get going, but they know what that means. And there was different feelings throughout the students, I think, at the beginning. A lot of them say, oh, I have detention. And you know, we're just trying to change the name a little bit because the kids do come on their own um, as well. But for the students that have late, missing, incomplete assignments, um, before it gets too late or before it gets out of control or just so they can feel comfortable as far as a place to go for support, um, this works well. Um, behavior, often, you know, if, so it can be a consequence. It can be for work. Um, and also sometimes parents say, you know, can my child stay? Um, do they provide, you know, do you provide extra help or is there somewhere um, that they can just do their work and quiet, quietly? And so all, all of these needs are met um, through the, the office hours model. Um, parents receive an email if students um, do not show up that are assigned. We will show you in a minute. We keep a, a uh, Google document so all the teachers have a live access to it at all time so we can always see when kids are added and the, the, the teacher in charge 
um, will take attendance, look through the document, see the kids that are there, just verify uh, why they're there and who they're there for. And if they uh, say that they're there for you know, a missing English assignment for um, Mr. Matrano, we check them off and we actually put that student in the checked off box. So we keep this data um, throughout the year, um, which we'll get to later why, how it's useful that way. Um, but kids that are, that are assigned office hours and, and do not come, just get a quick email home. Um, we, we have a, a, like a generic format where parents are just aware that your student was assigned office hours today and they didn't show up. Um, you know, we're, we're hoping they, we see them tomorrow. So, they, so that keeps them. It'll come back in a second. <laughs> so it keeps everybody in loop. So it opens communication between. That, that has been you know, an issue in the past. Sometimes parents are, are wondering why there's, you know, there's so much work missing or why maybe their grade has slipped. And so this way we uh, keep it um, consistent day to day. And this is just an example of um, the email. We literally send the same format email to the parents, um, you know, get the same thing. And it's just basically to let them know that they're students. So basically, let me back up actually. So say Friday is my day. Um, say little John Smith is supposed to stay after and um, he forgot or maybe he has something and he came in and checked with me and said, I can't stay, but I'm going to come in on Monday to make up that assignment. So I'll say, all right, it's no problem. Um, just, I'm just going to send something home just so that your parents know and they can maybe remind you over the weekend so that you can get here on Monday. And he'll say, okay. And then we send something like this and it'll say, you know, hi, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. I just want to let you know that Johnny was supposed to stay after today for Mr. Toomey, a missing social studies assignment. Uh, he met with me and mentioned that he can't um, be here today and that he'll show up on Monday. I just wanted to keep you informed to make sure that that's okay. And if it isn't, um, the parents and the students know that there is a little flexibility because we do understand that stuff gets in, w in the way and they have doctor's appointments and different after school activities. So just the next available day that they can come um, is when we expect them to show up. And we put that on our Google document so that it's in this little like note section that all the teachers kind of can see and so that we're all on the same page. And I think it, it just helps kids from falling through the cracks who, mm -hmm. who might disappear at the end of the day and, and it, you know, it's hard to keep track. So if they know we're going to be consistently following well, parents and each of the, the teachers on team um, consistently do this day to day, it, it, it gets them in a place where they know, you know uh, it, it, it helps them, I think. Mm -hmm. So this is just kind of what I was talking about with the conflict and that's just um, if the child can't stay, that they're, they should check in with the teacher that's on duty that day. So we really do actually stress that, that um, if they can't stay, they, before they scoot out of school, they do need to check in with whoever is on duty that day and face-to-face -face talk to them, let them know, um, you know, I know that I owe this and I have this, um, you know, expectation that I need to finish this assignment, but I can't be here today, so I'm going to come tomorrow. Um, it just kind of helps a little bit more with that responsibility, make sure that they have that ownership um, of that missing work or whatever it is, maybe they're absent and they need something to be, um, to, you know, a lesson to be retaught or something like that. Okay, so this is what our, just an example, we cleared all the names off, but on a day-to-day -day basis as um, students are uh, put in by each of the teachers, we can add the name of the student, um, who assigned it, what teacher assigned it, the date that the student was assigned, what they should be accomplishing during office hours, uh, what time student can leave. Sometimes that varies because the standard is 2.30 or 3.30, but sometimes it's a student who's just coming in to finish some work or just needed to um, take a, a quiz or something, or use a yeah. computer. Um, so that might vary as well. And then over to the right is when the teacher who's actually on duty fills that part out. Um, so if John Smith showed up, I'll put in my name, they served on 3-9, and um, I'll clear that off. We, we have a, another, we have a checked off list. And so from the beginning of the year, we have um, you know, hundreds of, of names. And that data is, is, is useful to us because every once in a while we'll look at it and you can sort it. And you can see can, what kids are, are showing up most often, um, what subjects they're showing up most often for. Um, even we started, saw, saw a couple kids who were appearing a lot in October, November, but now their names have slowly you know, disappeared. So it's showing growth of certain kids, it's showing where kids are struggling, what subjects. If you know, one kid was showing up for science every, every week, 
you know, we, we, we talk about that and what the issue is. Uh, some kids are across the board, and those are the ones, I think our original goal was the focal students, that would have been that child, but I think this is helping, you know, more kids than, than just them. And we also have a couple students, not a lot, but just a couple students who um, are, it's difficult for them to focus after school once they get home, and they've actually requested if they can come pretty much every day. Um, just to sit and you know it's not something that they like love to do but they know that it's good for them and they want to um, get that work done and I think that's the feeling that they that they love um, so we have about three or four kids that do show up every you know Monday Tuesday Thursday Friday to get that work done so that when they leave their backpacks a little bit lighter they have less work to kind of worry about when they get home and we're there in case they have any questions so if they do need to take a social studies test um, while I'm on duty that day, I'll have that test and I can check it over quickly before 2.30 um, rolls around and I can help that student um, as much as I can with support on Friday after, afternoon. So um, it has been really effective, I think, in, in a lot of different ways. Okay, and so some of the, the benefits that we've seen as a team are, um, you know, this is, this is trackable. We can keep, keep track of what students are coming when, as I said, the subjects, um, how often, how frequently they're coming. Um, it holds students accountable. Um, it makes efficient use of time for students to, to have a place to go and do work. Um, there's definitely, have, one of the big things I've seen, strength of communication between uh, not only students and teachers, because we're, we're all on the same page, but parents keeping them in the loop. And when you get the, all three of those um, um, communicating, it, it always seems to work out much better. And then a dis decreased missing assignments, because kids know that they will be held accountable, there's less slipping through the cracks, there's less disappearing, and they're, they're held because of the accountability. Um, it's, it's improving a lot of students' um, responsibility there in their grades. And then, this one might be tough to see, but I, I did a little mini activity in our argument unit where um, the kids had to argue if they thought office hours was a positive thing or a negative thing, and I thought a lot of them would say, like, oh, this is such a negative thing, but when they kind of put the pros and cons down on their paper, a lot of them were saying some really positive things um, about office hours, that it's like a, check in, a second chance to learn what they might have missed in class, um, that they like that it's not mandatory and they can go when it fits in with their schedule. Um, it's, you know, it's a place where they don't get distracted because home sometimes with all the things that, you know, they can, you know, get into trouble with their technology and stuff that's at home, you know, at school, they have a second set of eyes on them, any extra help that they need, um, teaches them responsibility. So, you know, there were just a bunch of things, I think, which was eye-opening for us to see that they saw that also. So. And I think over time, I mean, there's some kids, I, I think at, at first it was, it was like a label, you're going to office hours, like the detention thing, but now it's just, I, it, it's so open, kids are coming and going, and yeah. some are there for, you know, uh, consequences for certain things, for missing yeah. work or behavior, but others are just there to borrow a computer, others, yeah. so it, kids are constantly in and out, and as Julie said, a few kids have said to me, she said, I, I, I like being here, it's, you know, I, I like getting work done before I go home, yeah. and I'm like, yeah, I, I would love that. So, and I think they feel better about it. So, Mr. Robinson, yes. I just had another question. So, at, do you do you find in those that you, situations where kids will help kids, uh, where they'll yeah. each other? Yes. Oh, so collaborate, kid, especially right around now when kids have been out for you know a couple days, um, they'll show up with a friend or. <clears throat> Since it's all on team stuff, we're all kind of, you know, in English working on the same thing in, in each English class. So I could have one kid helping another kid um, on an assignment, and I could be helping another kid on something else. And so it is nice to get that cooperative learning going on, too, in the room. And we do have to manage, we do still have to manage, you know, who's in there and why they're there. But today, I had, I had Mondays, and today I had a, um, one student there who was. Uh, doing some math, and the other, and he asked for help from another kid who came over. So they they were working on math together That's while great. somebody else was just completing an assignment. So it's, um, there's a lot of different purposes. And it seems to to work well. That's great, <laughs> Mrs. Browski. Thank you, um, thank you for that great presentation. I was wondering, you, I love that you're collecting data because that's fantastic. 
have you could you share with us any trends that you're seeing? Are you, you know, initially was it more one type of kid, and then you started seeing a different type of kids? Are you seeing trends and particular needs that they're presenting? Well, one thing we saw, um, as I mentioned, is some kids were showing up a lot in the fall. You know, late fall. We started this. We really started getting going this like late fall, but um, November, December. You know, or no, uh, October, November. Same kids, and then a, a couple of those kids, at least two. We look back in you know January, February, March, and they practically disappeared. So it shows that at least you know they've made some adjustments to to not appear anymore, and that's just one way. I know there's some other ones. Um, I was seeing some kids who would be showing up on the Monday list, and to me that was kind of like oh maybe over the weekend they're not really as structured as maybe they were on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday. Um, so that was something that we kind of need to tighten up. You know, I spoke with a couple of the kids that that was an issue for, and um, we kind of just talked about different strategies at home and, um, and how office hours, it's kind of, we, we, we're trying to get them to see it as a place to catch up on any extra work, but also um, not a place to like, oh, well, I missed tonight's homework. Um, I'm gonna sit through class and, and be behind, you know what I mean, and then just catch up. So it's, it was almost like every day this kid felt like he was just catching up. So we just talked about like, well, how can we make some change, changes and he, you know, he's rarely on there. So, yeah. And one of the things we have for one of our upcoming team meetings to look at uh, subject area and what students, you know, who's showing up most frequently for what subjects and, and you know, maybe how time. to address those issues as well. So I think it's a lot, you know, and I think by the end of the year, we're, you know, this was new to us, so we, we made some, some mistakes, but I think we've worked those out. So by June, you know, as a team, we'll see what worked, what didn't, and adjust, and um, I think we definitely plan on continuing this for next year. Thank you. Mrs. Webb? Yeah. Um, thank you. I, I was just wondering if you find that you're able to collect any information where you're providing feedback to, your te to the teachers on the teams um, that might then assist the students. So is it... Um, you know, are you, you gaining something that can then help inform the teacher if there's a gap or yeah. special attention? Yes, yeah, so like, um, like in math, like if, like, I've um, emailed, like, Mr. <coughs> Gomes or something and said, you know, I tried my best to help the student with the math. It's not my, oh. you know, strongest point, but I, I did see that she is struggling with this concept, so maybe check in with her mm -hmm. during lunch after school just to make sure that she understands. We've also had parents email us and say, you know, my child was doing the homework this weekend and I was noticing that this, um, you know, analysis for English class was kind of a struggle and she's not really seeing like the abstract. Um, she's seeing this really concrete, can, is there a day that you can work on this with her after school? So um, it's been helpful both in both directions, I feel like. Great. Mr. Knight? Yeah, so very good. Um, I'm impressed with it. The question I have, just what is there a, a can you give me a percentage of uh, students that are uh, assigned and those that are drop in? Do you have that data yet? Uh, not officially, but I would say, um, it, I'd say it's evening out. Uh, yeah. Originally, it was a assigned. Yeah. Um, and as more kids saw that there was a place to go and like, <clears throat> Really said, you know, a lot of kids, technology could be an issue or, or just somewhere to, to work. I would say it's almost even, uh, maybe not quite. Yeah. 50-50, yeah. uh, I would say. Um, today I had, it, it was, I had about nine kids in there, and I think it was more kids were there on their own. I think it was like four were there assigned, and, and four or five were there just catching up on things. And they make it a point. They say, I was, nobody told me to come here, but I'm here. I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Which is good, because I know they know I'm going to ask them. So. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Mr. Robinson? Yeah, I, I just had a quick, another quick question along the lines of Ms. Webb. Uh, do you envision uh, maybe uh, will there, will there be, where there will be like a post-mortem where you look at uh, maybe you have to go back to the teachers and say, you know, the, the way this, this concept's being taught is producing a lot of students to come back in here for as far as why why students are coming to office yeah hours. and maybe use that as a way to maybe we change some of the teaching concepts or I, I, could, I mean I don't think we're there yet but definitely if a lot of kids are, are showing up for the same reasons and we're noticing yeah. you know math or an English you know issue um, I think that that's definitely something that could be used absolutely thank you yes. 
go for it. Very quick. I just want to say that I love that you're calling it office hours because I struggle with my three college boys going, go to the office hours. So they'll be so comfortable. By the time they get to college, these kids are going to be like, yeah, office hours, awesome. <laughs> So the notion of we're trying to, right now, we're trying to instill the idea that, you know, we're not going to let you slip through the cracks, mm -hmm. okay? You have to be accountable to not only us, but to yourself. And the ability for the teachers to verify, so our, a model that we still have that we, that's still kind of difficult is if a student is assigned to homework center after school, <coughs> you know, kids will often come in and say, well, I, I have that work or it's done. This model is really tight in regard to communication. So the teachers are talking to the kids, they're talking to the parents. They're also verifying what kids are saying. So kids, the, the level of work that kids are producing and this idea that I need to be accountable, I can't just say, oh yeah, I'm just trying to, it's, it's done. It's in the mail. It's, <laughs> it's in my, oh geez, I can't find, you know. They, they have to show it, they have to produce it. And the teachers also are able to support one another. So they're learning about the learners, but students are also becoming more self-aware of what it takes. So it, it, for me, I'm usually encouraged when I hear Chris and Julie say, you know, we started off with a whole cohort of kids, and now those kids, they know that if they're not getting it done, then we're gonna intervene. Not in a negative way, but in a positive way mm -hmm. to say, you know, we're not going to let you slide with this. We can't. We're not going to give you a pass on this. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it doesn't feel punitive. And there are kids that now where it's like, yep, I go to office hours. They just, you know, are you assigned? No, it's just what they do, which is great. I also feel like, sorry, just to jump on, in on that, the kids are also like, um, like, is it okay if I hang out here, even if I don't have that much homework to do? And it's, sure, you know, come on and hang out. They might help another kid with something. But it's also nice to see that they feel like that they have that connection with us where, you know, because it's not, you need to come after school today and this is a punishment. And, you know, they feel like uh, there's, it's more of a safe place and it's more <coughs> supportive and there's that trust. And um, I just feel like I have, like, a different level of... Um, a relationship, I guess, that it's, it's, I don't know, it just feels a little bit more like they are... Um, the relationship is based on trust. Yeah. Right? If you can't make it, great. We'll see you tomorrow. You know? Okay. And it works well. Thank you. So um, our team has, has approached MTSS with uh, kind of a, an, an initiative that focuses on promoting what we would consider like positive learning behaviors um, and creating kind of a, a culture of accountability within the team and linking it to the, um, the core values that our school already has. To kind of backtrack for a second. Oops, guess not. Um, Um, to kind of backtrack for a second, at last year, Jean Duran, Jane Costa, and I uh, presented to you guys about the student-led conferences, and, and what we found came out of it was the increased ownership and the increased accountability on the kids, as well as their ability to be self-aware of their trends in their writing. And as a team, we became aware um, through completing things that we called writing trends reports, where we looked for patterns in student writing, um, areas where gaps existed. And we, we left for the summer last year thinking, wouldn't it be great if we could do the same thing about kids' learning habits? Kids' trends of learning. What patterns are we seeing as a team? How do we then address those habits? And how do we make them kind of ingrained with the kids? So we, we left with kind of two essential questions in the summer. Um, um, and we, we talked about how can we help kids become more self-aware and what are the kinds of positive behaviors that we want them to, to display and be aware of. And we also left an understanding of until we get the next set of kids in front of us, it becomes impossible to start that dialogue. Um, so in the fall, I think this is where you would come in, Jane. Um, so, so yeah, we, I mean, we could try to predict what the issues would be, but we decided we should become students of our students before we decided um, 
what behaviors we were looking for. So in the fall, um, we observed student learning behaviors and just talked as a team and kept note of um, things that they were thriving in and um, some things that we saw as issues that we wanted to address with them. And so once we collected some information, we shared our observations and our hopes with our team of students. In, um, in a very positive way, we had a meeting with our entire team of students um, in the auditorium and we shared with them what, their, what we saw as their strengths and then um, some goals in very positive language, which we'll show. Um, so some things that we noticed right off the bat in September, <coughs> very polite group of kids. There, I mean, there are just multiple kids every day that leave my classroom, thank you, Mrs. Costa, have a great day. And, um, and we wanted to commend them for that. They're the kind of group, too, that usually a sub, almost always oh, yeah. if one of us is absent, makes a note of how polite they really the collective are. grade is. So we wanted to make sure we emphasize what they already do really well. Um, thank their parents. Yes, yes, <laughs> that, that is where it is taught. Um, we also found that overall they're very responsible for turning in their work. We don't have a lot of homework issues, a lot of um, kids not completing the work. And they work really well together. They genuinely seem to enjoy each other. They um, are helpful with each other. They're, um, they're collaborators. So we wanted to tell them that we appreciated those things about them right off the bat. And then these were our hopes for them for their seventh grade year. Um, we wanted them to be able to advocate for themselves, ask when they don't understand something to feel comfortable asking for help. Um, we wanted them across the board to recognize and consistently follow our class routines and procedures. And we wanted them to start thinking about learning goals and, um, and behaviors that they needed to do to achieve their goals. And um, one of our core values is personal best. They're kindness, community, and personal best. So really helping them to define what their personal best is and working to achieve their personal best and really push themselves um, to persevere when things get tough and to really strive for their best. And I would, I would just add, based off of what, what Jane had mentioned too, I think one of the most important things that we did as a team, the six of us, was making sure that our language in coming up with this list wasn't a complaint fest. It was what do we want for these kids, mm -hmm. not not what do we have to fix about them, but what do we hope by the time they leave seventh and move on to the eighth grade teams that they've made significant gains in. Um, so this process, um, it, it, there's a lot of different angles that have to be covered. The first being <coughs> guiding them through this reflection process. Um, some kids are their toughest critic, and some kids are the opposite. Um, and trying to find that balance with them. So we have a, a rating scale and, and slash reflection that they've been completing at various points throughout the year. Um, we've also included student-driven goal setting with each behavioral or um, with each rating scale that's being completed and um, a few times we've had the opportunity to have individual one-on-one -on -one conferences where each teacher takes a, um, a homeroom and then has a, a period to meet with each kid one-on-one -on -one and discuss what their goals are and discuss what the team's impressions are um, and we all meet prior to that meeting um, and give each other feedback from what's being seen across the team. So it's a consistent approach. It's not just I'm telling you how you're doing in English. I'm sharing with you how things are going in social studies, in science, and in Spanish. Um, so this chart up here, um, our three core values at Parker are kindness, community, and personal best. And in trying to stay consistent with those, um, we wanted to build behaviors off of those three ideas. So for each section, there are three indicators be below each. So kindness is wait your turn to speak, listen actively, use positive and considerate language. I think it's really no surprise with what we've already said about these kids. Most of these kids are fours and threes. Um, four being always, three most of the time, and then down the line. Um, for being part of a community, we talked a lot about sharing ideas and participating in your learning, doing a fair share of group work, and respecting personal space and belongings. For some reason, seventh grade boys love stealing pens. I haven't been able to figure it out yet. Seventh uh, grade girls love hugging. Yes, and we'll get to that in a second. Um, and for the, the personal best, which I think when we think about our group of kids this year, and again, it's important to emphasize this process has to reset every year. Some of them might be the same, but the kids that we get are going to dictate what the behaviors are that they need. Um, we felt like a lot of these kids just weren't pushing themselves, or they were, they were just kind of, um, one of the paraeducators we work with used the word coast. 
and there are some kids that are really good to getting to a certain point, and when they could push themselves to exceed the expectation, they're like, no, nah, I'm here, I'm good. Um, so that idea of owning learning was really important. We think that's one of the cornerstones of seventh grade, um, making it less about the parents being involved and making it more about kids emailing us, kids contacting us, kids coming after school to connect with us, uh, being prepared, homework materials, etc. And then this one especially, um, don't settle, keep on pushing yourself um, and keep on finding new ways to redefine what that personal best is with the kids. Uh, so this is actually um, a young lady's, this is the top of the rubric and then this is what the bottom would look like. So it says after reviewing the behaviors above, one strength I have that I model is. So we ask kids to think about if we were going to give you like a, say you were the model, what skills would those be and she said she's always prepared. Um, some one area she needs to work on, listening actively, sometimes I get distracted and off task. This is one of the honest ones. Um, write a specific goal that focuses on one area in one of these behaviors, share ideas and participate in your learning. Um, that's a goal that probably, this is the, probably the first time we did this. I think second time around we would ask them to be sure to be a little more specific, kind of follow that smart goal template of what's that going to look like in every class. And then we ask them to specifically explain what other people will see, students and teachers, to show that that goal is being accomplished. And she came up with, I will ask questions if I don't understand. I'll raise my hand and participate and share my answers. Oh, you want to take this one, yeah. Jane? <laughs> so yes, um, seventh grade boys steal pens and seventh grade girls love hugging. Um, some of them definitely, you turn around and they're sharing a seat. They're, you know, there's the personal space issues. So this um, student was, again, very honest, um, great kid, very sweet, does her work all the time, but one area that she needs to work on is respecting personal space, and the goal was to stop hugging everyone. Um, <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if we should have her put a, have her put a number on that. <laughs> yes. I will prove this by not touching people. People will see me being in a personal bubble. And yeah, <laughs> so seventh grade. And then here's another one too that I, I think is really encouraging when the kids early in the year are dishonest with each other. It's nice when we look at them and then we say, yeah, this is pretty spot on for what we feel that where this kid is. And you'll notice a lot of them have to do with, again, pushing himself, again, sharing ideas um, and taking risks in a class, especially when they may or may not know the correct answer, especially when it's abstract. Uh, and this kid made notes that his goal is pushing himself to volunteer more. And he says, every class I will share, even if I'm not positive, um, uh, that it's right. Others will see me taking risks. Um, and I, I, I'm happy to report that for both of the kids that have written that, we've seen significant gains with them. And we've been able to say like, hey, we know you wrote that down. We're really proud of you because we see it. So keep on doing it. Uh, whereas in the past, that might have been in the back of their head, but we never had it on paper. We never made them stop and think about it. So there's really no documentation for us to. I think there, there's an accountability piece here that when you write it down and you talk to a teacher about it and you know that we all know they, they're thinking about their goals more than I've seen in the past. And, um, and I see kids actively trying to reach their goals. Um, so the next step for us was um, some reflection for the students. Um, they came during our, um, our flex time, our team time, and um, they wrote letters to themselves, Dear Me letters, from the team. So they wrote as if they were the team of teachers, um, sort of progress letters as to how they thought we thought they were doing. Um, they shared these reflections with parents and guardians at home, and it coincided with progress report time in, I believe, December, January. 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 Yeah, right. um, so, so this helped with communication at home too so that parents knew what they were working on. Um, and this example I just thought was so striking and so honest. Um, and so accurate. And so accurate. It, it really <coughs> describes um, how this student is doing. I was, um, I was especially impressed at the end um, when he said, you've done a good job reaching your goal of last quarter by raising your hand five times in class, but you seem to be more passive on subjects that require you more thought. So he, re he really did yeah. reflect on that. All we ask of you is to push yourself a little farther and take challenges instead of stepping away from them. I mean, realistically, this is almost exactly what any one of us would have written to him mm -hmm. in a progress report comment. It, it's, it's no different. I mean, the only difference is I think it's more meaningful because he said it and he knows it. Um, so we've actually been able to call him to task occasionally and say, well, you know, you said you don't like to push yourself. 
or you don't push yourself, here's an opportunity for you to do that. Um, I think that it, it adds to a team culture, and again, it breaks down the barriers of individual classrooms. This is another really good one. Do you have the? I do. Um, so the student speaks softly and writes lightly. Um, we've been talking about this student all year and, and speaking with this student. Um, she's, she has great ideas, and she's very, very bright, but, um, but pretty shy, and at the beginning of the year, pretty passive. And when I read this letter, I mean, it's better than any of us could have written to her. Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but at the end, she, she says, we, we noticed the change because last quarter you weren't as aware of what was going on in class and you weren't participating very much. But this quarter, I can tell you're more aware. You still need to work on participation. We know that you know the answers and we know you're shy, but we want you to try your hardest to raise your hand as much as possible. As a goal moving forward, we think you should make sure you're always actively listening and participating. And um, I can tell you that I noticed last week we were, we were doing a review and the student just had her hand up participating like crazy. I knew that it was, it's not easy for her to, to do that, to put herself out there and um, and you can see that she's reflecting on what we're telling her and taking that feedback and, uh, and really making that a goal. And I think on a, on a team level too, one of the conversations that's kind of sprouted as a result of this is um, what does active engagement look like mm -hmm. all the time, mm -hmm. um, especially with books like Quiet being out now, talking about kids that are just naturally introverted. Um, so how much, what's the difference in them showing engagement? I think in the case of this young lady, um, she's never going to be the kid who, raise, who raises their hand 30 times a class. Thank God, because her class has enough of those. But <laughs> it, it, she, she still finds ways to get engaged. I think mm -hmm. we're, as a team, are redefining what we think engagement is mm -hmm. and trying to show kids there are other ways to show that you're being an active mm -hmm. participant and you're learning than just raising your hand or just participating in a round table. There are plenty of other ways. Julie, can get that? Thank you. Um, there are plenty of other ways to be there. So that's been kind of an interesting dialogue that's been going on at the team level. Um, in terms of what we expect of kids and how they show that. Um, so as far as how this has affected our professional practice, because this is our professional practice goal, um, we do have focal students, two students in each of our four homerooms that we are tracking um, and discussing um, probably a, a, with a little more of a microscope than all the other kids. Um, we tried to pick kids from a variety of backgrounds, kids with IEPs, kids without IEPs, kids with 504s, um, general education students. and what it's provided us with is a consistent language to talk with and about students. So now we all have those same kind of like nine things that we're looking for and that we're always talking about and bringing up when we go to a team meeting. Um, consistent measures for gauging student learning behaviors. Again, now we're all on the same page about what we expect of them and how to help them if they don't. And building off of that, there's a common starting point for all of us to discuss both with kids and groups of kids um, that there are actionable steps can, that can be taken based off of these goals. It's pretty concrete, which seventh graders love concrete. Mm -hmm. um, so here's an example of how it would affect our practice. This form was filled out by teachers, myself and Bill McIndor. Sometimes we split the work on focal students. Um, myself and Bill McIndor, the science teacher, sat down one day during a common prep and looked at a gentleman from my homeroom. And we went down the line and we filled out. The ones that are bolded and underlined is how he scored himself. And we noticed this interesting pattern developing of a lot of independent behaviors he was marking himself down for. You'll notice sharing ideas. You'll notice um, persevere through challenging work. You'll notice own your learning. He's all feeling like he's not doing. And this is a kid that, um, that we like to call like a chameleon. He loves to just blend. Let me, let me just kind of sit here and maybe nobody will notice what I'm doing or not, or not doing. A very talented kid though. So at the bottom of, their, their rubric looks slightly different than ours. At the bottom of the rubric, we have two sections that the teachers fill out. The first is, what are we looking for as signs of growth? So after looking at that list, one of the things that Bill and I came up with is, there needs to be a more careful approach to, approach to completing work. We'll see growth if there are less careless mistakes in some of his work. Um, more clarity and cohesion in his final product, and more consistent involvement in learning activities, especially independent ones. How is he advocating for himself? How is he using independent time um, that's different than where he seems to be now? Um, so the action steps, this student happens to already be in an English-based flex group, so working with the student on proofreading checkl and checklist strategies, 
um, providing more check-ins with students during independent work time. And I can already tell you just this week, having that in the back of my head while they've been working on, in their argument writers workshop has been a big difference for me to know that I have to continually make sure I'm checking in and prompting him to advocate more. And, and actually, it was kind of a nice moment last week. For the first time all year, he came and found me, which has never happened. Uh, and let the student know that we believe in his abilities, but we need to see it consistently. So again, that positive, um, and a lot of times that can be done either just one teacher decides, I'm going to talk to that kid, or we decide as a team or just two of us that we need to have a little meeting with them and, and give them some um, cool and warm feedback as far as where we see them and, and involve them in the conversation. Um, yes, go ahead. Are you finding that the students are consistent across disciplines? Like, I would have been much quieter in math class than I was in English or social studies. And I think it's wonderful that you mentioned your meeting with a science teacher. So that in and of itself might give you some information about the students and how do you deal with that. What would you say? Um, I mean, I, I've seen in some of the um, feedback that they've, that they've written from us to themselves, I participate a lot in Spanish because you, you know they, they love speaking Spanish as their first year. I participate a lot in Spanish, but I need um, I need to participate more in ELA and social studies. So so sometimes more of the um, the more abstract, um, they're holding back a little bit. I was going to say sometimes we get a lot of like like even when Bill and I was sitting down to talk about a different student, it came up that there was a lot more participation going on in silent science than there was mm -hmm. ELA. And then when we broke down kind of well, let's think about this kid we were able to see that she often responds to a right or wrong question when she knows the right answer. Mm -hmm. But when we're in a little more of a gray space where there needs to be some support, there needs to be a little more of a development, she doesn't. So that was a consistent thing that we saw. And, and similar to that, that gentleman that wrote earlier about wanting to take risks, he falls in the same category. If he's in science, if I ask him like for the answer on a vocab sheet, his hand's going to come up. If I ask him to analyze the symbolism of the white circle and the white circle, probably not. Mm -hmm. um, that's just where he is. So that's been an interesting conversation, Linda. Um, so I, as, I oh, go ahead. Question. Can, can you go back to the one where the, the young lady wrote her own, I guess, assessment? Yes. Other. So, uh, and I saw that you, and you mentioned the other teacher you worked with wrote, I guess what I, you, you call them action steps, and it was a result of, of one of these. Uh, yeah. So my question is, if, I mean, that, that's pretty astute of a student to be able to do that. Do, do you think about ask, if they know what the issues are, the problem, have you at, thought about asking them to write a remediation plan or how, how oh, they we, they, they're completely involved in that process, uh, Mr. Robinson. We, from kind of the ground level, and I think that's one of the, for me, the most, the most enjoyable part of this school has been the one-on-one -on -one conferences. Mm -hmm. um, we each took a group. So that, they're part of that. Oh, yeah, no, they sit down with us. Okay. So what, actually, while they were working on this assignment, the first time it was being done, that gave us the space to pull the kids out of the room or directly like at the door and just sit with them for two or three minutes at a time <clears throat> and just check in. And it was really interesting, too, because some kids that I was kind of thinking in my head, they're, they're probably going to be shy and I'm probably going to have to kind of run the show. Um, they came up right away and they were like, I know this is what I have to do. And that was really encouraging to me because then – when they don't do it later, you can say, but you just told me you knew. So where's the disconnect? How can we fix this? I think bringing them into that conversation, um, which is similar to what we tried to do with the writing goals we've had in the team the last four or five years, that's made a difference because they now feel like I'm part of this. Um, and it is chipping away at it. I, I mean, to be honest, I wish we had more time for this. Sometimes this gets lost, lost in the shuffle of everything. And we are trying to work as a team to determine how can we make it a more concrete, built-in part of our day. Or, or part of our schedule is they're like part of a flex period every cycle that we're going to spend 15 minutes in this group and just debriefing about our goals. How do we make that work? Because I think we're seeing the benefits. I think what we need is more consistency. Mm -hmm. I think too, um, to answer your question, so when we ask the kids how they're going <coughs> to address these, th they sometimes think of ways to address it that I wouldn't have thought of. So I mean, they. That's know them, sometimes know themselves well. Um, I, had a, I had a student tell me she wanted to participate more, but she felt really unsure of whether she she was afraid of getting the answer wrong. So so part of her goal was to um, check in with the paraeducator in the room and just make sure she was on the right track before raising her hand and sharing with the class. And I thought that was um, that was very self aware and a great 
a great strategy for her. And, and there's been other other ways too that we've been able to help. For example, um, we, we have a student in Mr. McIndoor's homeroom who is so eager to always share his ideas and doesn't always give them time to simmer and kind of percolate. So they'll come up and then he'll like get halfway through and go, uh, uh, and just stop. So when we talked during the, the um, conversation, he was feeling frustrated by that because he was feeling like it became an issue of like, I'm, I'm just, I can't do this because he feels down because he wants to share. And then as soon as he goes to share and it gets to the abstract level, he just hits a, a wall. So one of the things that I promise to do for him in English class, especially when those kinds of questions come up, is when I present the question to the class, I'll pause for a moment and I'll ask the kids to think for 15 seconds, then raise their hand. And that he knows that's my signal to him of I want you to take the time. So it also helps us to, and the rest of the team knows that we're doing that. So it helps us to build relationships with the kids and know that we're gonna do whatever it takes to make you feel successful. Mm -hmm. Great. Mr. Knight? Yeah, how, how long did it take for you to get a read on this group? What? I think we did this within a month and a half did, or so. I think we came up with the, the goals in October. I wanna say it was right around the, the middle of the first quarter. We, and the conversation, we kind of tried to devote parts of all of our team meetings leading up to it to what are we seeing so far? What are we liking? What is kind of concerning us? And, and what are we noticing as a general trend, not individual kids? What are some of the behaviors that we're seeing that we love? And what are some of the behaviors that we need to improve? I just want to say it, it's, to me, it's the model example of what team, the, the team approach really is all about. So congratulations for, for taking these initiatives that Thank go, you. I think, beyond what is typically seen, at least what I've seen, not here, but um, so, so this definitely has, um, our goal has started to shape <coughs> our team culture. We noticed it after the January and February interruption after interruption after snow after snow after uh, vacation yeah. that the kids, um, when they came back from February vacation, were just they not. Were, they were driving us nuts. They, yeah. <laughs> they just were very sluggish um, and not with the program. So we said, you know what, we need to do a little booster on this because um, they need a shot in the arm. We're, they're driving us nuts. They're probably driving themselves nuts, and um, and we need to talk to them about this. So, um, so we posed this question to them, and instead of saying it in a negative way, you're driving us nuts and you're slugs and you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, we asked them um, to think about what they could do each day that would make them feel proud of their work, not just to do it, not just to get it done, but really our goal for them is for them to feel proud of themselves. Um, so we posed that question to them as a whole group. And we kind of introduced like our theme of 2015 was the word pride. And we had done an activity in English class prior where each, at, coming off of the new year where each kid picked their own word that was gonna be their theme. It kind of lined up, we were doing theme study with a Christmas carol um, and we just tried to uh, make that seamless. So the kids were familiar with the language so we tried to let them know that our, our theme from now until June is pride. We're always gonna ask you what have you done to make yourself feel proud today? And then we're gonna say we're not mad at you but if you haven't, what do you have to do? Or what do we have to do? What, what's not working? Um, so in each of our team classrooms, we, we put up a poster like this and, um, <coughs> and students can write on it and we'll write on it when we notice something. Um, just acknowledging behaviors that students display of um, things that other people, they, they, they might acknowledge someone else in their class um, and what they're proud of or things that they've done that they're proud of. And to get them in this mode, um, during that, so again, Jane mentioned, we, we kind of pulled them back together. Um, we came into a, another, um, like kind of cost the team power in the auditorium at the beginning of a flex period. And we, we talked about, we kind of leveled with them, that we realized that the momentum that was being lost due to two days off every week, um, that we realized it's affecting all of us, uh, but that we had seen too much growth to let them start to give up on themselves at, at, at this point. And um, will we, each teacher on teams so of seven different adults then went around and identified a kid they're proud of and explained why or why this, this kid should feel proud. And we definitely tried to pick from an array of kids so it wasn't just the seven kids that everyone figured, but kids that we've also seen tremendous growth in from September to this point. And that kind of set the tone moving forward. And then you can see a little close up more of, that's kind of hard to read. Um, but for example, in the corner right there, it says group 75 should be proud because everyone actively participated. So they're starting to use some of the language that we talked about. Um, 
one of them says, Nia should feel proud because she told me to stop crying and go eat some ice cream. Because um, that made me feel better because I love food. So seems kind of concrete, but it is kindness. Um, and then it, there are other, you know, Mrs. Costa noted, again, early on in the process, we're, this like literally happened two weeks ago maybe. And um, we've been modeling a lot. Most of that handwriting on the first one is me pointing out moments. And what gets really hard is you do have those kids who are like, well, my, why isn't my name up there? And I, I always try to tell them, too, I could fill six of these a day if I, if I had the time to stop every moment. Um, so the other thing we've been noticing early on is that a lot of them um, are becoming product focused, not process focused. So we had to stop and have a conversation with them about, we think it's great that you're proud of the 104 on your science test, but what did you do to get the 104? Mm -hmm. You know, we think it's great that you got an exceeding expectation on your white circle response, but what did you come after school? What steps did you take? Why are you proud of it? What did mm -hmm. you do to earn feeling proud? And that's been kind of the shift in the conversation for them. Yeah, there's the one. <coughs> Dr. Yeah. I just wanted to say I love that idea of the process focus, too, because you can get a C or a D on a test, but if you conquer one piece of it that you're proud of, that took your real grit, your real persistence, then that still leaves room to feel proud of what you did do well. And I think, Linda, that that's a really hard thing for seventh graders to wrap their brains around, that if they get a, a 75 on a quiz or they get a, get a C on a paper, that they n normally would have got a D on, for example. They, they don't necessarily see that they did persevere through something. I think they think of, I have to get 100 to feel like I've been successful in something. And that's kind of a culture that we're trying to change on the team. And for parents, too, I would think. Yeah, that's yes. probably the tougher part. Yeah. That growth mindset has been kind of an, an ongoing conversation both with us and then with the parents. Mrs. Burroughs. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this was so good to hear. I had a question, and you maybe haven't thought this far ahead, but looking forward to eighth grade, it would be really neat if there was a way for these individuals who've done so much self, um, had such an increase in self-awareness to, I'd be a little bit nervous about the summer, <laughs> June, July, August, and then they come back in September. Have you thought through how you can help them July sort of, yeah, that's true, July, <laughs> they're going to be in school practically until July this year, um, how they can um, sort of wrap up Here's how, here's how I've grown, and here's what I've learned this year, and like even to create a product that they could re-look at two months later as they start eighth grade. Is, have you thought I, about that at all? I think that's, that's absolutely <laughs> Yeah, I, I know. Um, the workaholic here was texting me some, some ideas <laughs> the other night that, um, that he thought they should maybe create some sort of a, um, like an award, if they were going to give themselves an award, what would it be for? And, and I think that that is definitely something, one, one way we could look at it. Yeah, we, we have, we've had other um, <coughs> um, things at the end of years that kind of like wrap up and summarize the year. Um, mostly we've done it on the writing where mm -hmm. they've done the student late conferences and then those portfolios are accessible by their eighth grade teachers because everyone's using the Google Drive. So if Steve Olivo or Brian James or English teachers wanted to see what they had <laughs> coming in, they could just say to the kids, can you share your portfolio to me? I'm going to take a look at it. I think um, also... Um, where our portfolio has has been focused on the writing in the past few years, we will definitely add a piece with the um, with the positive learning behaviors into their portfolio so that they can share that with their parents at their student led conference in May. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Did Mr. Lyons have his hand up? I, I think I would just add, Jane, in regard to your question. I think what both teams do as kids transition from seven to eight, not only do students travel with student work but they travel with information and data. So the teams conference with one another about individual students. This is what we feel students need. These are kind of a few bullet points that you know, we need to attend to to help the student continue a trend that they're on or support they need. So that is something that's done very thoughtfully and I, and I would argue very well with the, the teams from seven passing students on to eight. Thank you. We also do over the summer um, before they go to eighth grade, each, each teacher takes a stack of postcards and writes a postcard to a student that we had um, that previous school year. And a lot of times, um, we'll bring up things that we're proud of our growth that they've had. And it's kind of a reminder before they go back to school. Yeah, we, we try to wait to send them until like mm -hmm. July or into August. So there's kind of like a, a break from us. 
and then they get this little reminder of, oh, yeah, I, I had a great year. And I showed a lot of growth, and it may, kind of charges them up. We've actually gotten nice notes from parents saying that, like, their kid was feeling anxious about eighth grade, and that note kind of put them more at ease, and, you know, it's been nice. Mrs. Webb? Thank you. I, there's virtually nothing that I could add. I'm just so impressed. Thank you. And um, I think our students, we're fortunate, our students are fortunate, and I think we're going into a budget cycle that we got to figure out a way to keep supporting you all so that you can keep supporting our students. And I, there's so many connections here that it's just amazing. And I'm really just truly impressed. My, my last one is a junior going into senior year. And, uh, um, you know, I think every year we get better and better. And I think this is a real tribute to your whole team. Mr. Lyons, but I'm just, now we need to do our <coughs> job to make sure that you can keep doing yours really well. Thank you. We appreciate that. Mr. Lyons, thank you. Thank you for thank bringing you such job. wonderful thank teachers. You. Good job. Thank thank you. You. You're certainly welcome to stay, but I'm sure that you guys would actually like to go home at some point today. So thank you. Uh, Dr. Doherty, I know that we are going to need to go into executive session at 8.30, so let's see if we can get through report. Um, should we continue with reports? I think that we should probably go into continued business, Dr. Doherty. Yes. Um, where would you like to take us? We can either go into the budget presentation for Finance Committee. We could talk about the Elementary Space Needs Working Group. Yeah, we can go right in order. Okay, great. So um, as the committee knows, we'll be presenting to the FinCom group this week uh, our FY 2016 budget presentation. We are posted, obviously, as a school committee. Uh, that meeting... 7.30 at Town Hall Conference Room. 7.30 Town Hall Conference Room. So um, we're, we're working on a presentation that we will send to the committee ahead of time. Um, essentially, it's the introduction piece that you saw for the FY16 budget. We have received, um, I think, 10 questions, um, eight of them from one finance, one finance committee member and two, I think, were more global questions. So we're in the process of answering those. Wonderful. And I saw uh, Martha over the weekend, and I know that she had been working on those questions. So thank you very much. Uh, that's very much appreciated. Um, are there other speaking points that we need to be prepared for for that meeting? No. I, I mean, we'll, we will be talking about uh, the latest state numbers for next year, um, you know, and how, how that compares to the communities that we, we, we compare ourselves to. Okay, so, great. you know, that, that data will have available now. Great. Uh, did the committee have any specific questions regarding that meeting? I know that we're all looking forward to being there. Um, and I mean that sincerely, actually. The FinCom has been a wonderful group to work with over the years, so I'm looking forward to the conversation. Mrs. Webb? I just want to ask, so are the questions, uh, there must be different than the questions you've already asked that, I mean, you've already answered that we all asked. So, um, or it, it did, some of them are similar. I don't. So did, the select, we did, did we get that kind of feedback from the selectmen, or is it just no, here? Probably. Just, I think we had one of the selectmen here in our meeting. We've not received any questions from the selectmen. Right. Wh whom we don't present. We usually don't. To. We usually don't right. receive any questions from the selectmen. Great. So if they have questions, they should just ask us. If they have questions, certainly. Right. We don't have to have a meeting. Great. Thank you, Dr. Darty and Martha. Thank you very much for all the oh, for everything you've done for that. Um, the Elementary Space Needs Working Group update, Dr. Doherty. I'm actually going to let Mr. Robinson and Ms. Borowski. Fantastic. I'm talking on this one. Mr. Robinson, Mrs. Borowski, which one? Uh, just that, well, we're meeting. Uh, <laughs> Thursday night. The committee's meeting Thursday night. Uh, and, you know, up for discussion here, it's going to be our recommendation to the committee that uh, we, we go in a holding pattern or on a hiatus, I guess, until the fall, so that we can focus on uh, right now the uh, the 
the modular project uh, and then come back in the fall to discuss the long-term plan with the working group is that that's exactly what I think is a good strategy and it, I guess I open that up if anyone has any concerns or questions or I don't know what, what you think <laughs> that's right thank you when when will the town building committee be formed we voted for that at the town meeting the article has to be approved by the AG's office which I don't believe that's happened yet right so maybe that will be done too by fall so there'll be a system figured out how that building committee and the space committee can communicate with one another and that was another reasons why we had decided or talked about kind of postponing the future future meetings Thank you for everything. I appreciate all of the work that Mr. Robinson, and Mrs. Sprowski, and Mr. Boxer have done on that. Um, okay, great. We are moving right along. Update on elementary enrollment, Dr. Dory. In your packet, I have included an elementary chart for next year, since we're pretty much through with the enrollment. We'll have a few changes to this year's enrollment, but um, I want to point out a couple of things to you um, that I think are important. Uh, one is five years ago uh, the committee gave me the ability to use uh, the option where we could move students to other um, school schools within the district to keep class sizes balanced and we've used um, we've moved students that did not have siblings in a, in a school I think you can see that our work has um, paid off that the class size is projected for next year right now are, are pretty awesome. good across the board the last grade where with this did not happen is the current grade five, um, which is no longer on this chart because they'll be in sixth grade next year. Mm -hmm. um, so you can see that I mean, these class sizes are pretty good. Um, another reason why these class sizes look good, particularly in K-1, is because now we'll have modular classrooms and we've been able to restructure funding in the FY16 budget to get a grade one teacher at Josh Reed. So, those co that combination allows us to keep our class sizes in K and 1 um, also pretty good. Um, I do caution the community and the committee that it is March and school starts in September. Yeah. And we have kindergarten screening that we still have not gone through. And we still have not added to this list any possible retentions. Um, so some of these numbers may change. Um, but you see right now that, that I think we're in, we're in a good place. Uh, the breakdown right now, and again, this is not etched in stone, is that we'll have three and a half classrooms at Barrows next year, um, two and a half at Birch Meadow, three at Eaton, three and a half at Killam, two at Wood End for kindergarten. These are all kindergarten. Um, you'll also notice that we have 14 and a half FTEs this year for kindergarten. We have 14 and a half FTEs next year for kindergarten. That was very important because we do not have another teacher or teachers in the FY16 budget for kindergarten. So, um, you know, we've been able to do all this and keep the current, which is what we, we had told town meeting we would do, keep the current staffing levels. Mrs. Borowski. Thank you. Um, is it too soon to start thinking about how you're going to structure the kindergartens, like whether you would do it integrated or have a separate half-day program? Or? We usually make that decision after screening. Okay. I, I mean, uh, right now, again, numbers can change. It looks like that the integrated will be at Eaton and Woodend. Great. Okay. Dr. Doherty, I, I've been looking at this chart for many years with you. Uh, this is the best I think it's ever looked so congratulations mm -hmm. and thank you and I, I agree it's only March um, but honestly um, some of these numbers I, I can't remember seeing them that low there are still numbers um, that can that are concerning as always but again this is in fantastic shape for where we have been in previous years so thank you very much well any further questions awesome thank you um, let's talk for a moment we have time, Dr. Doherty, on the Josh Wheaton principal search process yes. and timeline, please. I believe the timeline is also in your packet. Um, the um, ad was placed on Friday on School Spring. It was in the Globe on Sunday, um, on Monster on Sunday as well. Um, we'll also be posting it to some other websites. 
the screening process we have pretty much fine-tuned over the years, and this is a similar process that we used two years ago with the Barrow search um, when we hired Ms. Leonard. Uh, we will be having two administrators. Um, a human resource administrator will be facilitating it. Um, three teachers, a support staff, three parents, and a community member. We are, we have sent out uh, to the Eaton community. We have sent out to uh, the Eaton teachers, uh, if anyone would like to be on that committee. Um, we also have sent out a survey to Eaton parents and teachers, asking them the qualities they want to see in the next principal. So all of that is going on right now. The timeline, the way it's set up right now, and again, this, this may change depending on snow or other things that could get in our way um, of the process, but um, we're looking at right now that we will be doing the interviews just before April vacation, and then take April vacation and just after April vacation um, with the finalists and doing site visits, open microphone nights, um, and other other things. It really is, as it's been in the past, a every step is a way to collect information on a candidate. Um, you know, it really you, you paint the whole picture when you look at the candidates in different venues. Um, the 45 minute plus interview that they have with the screening committee is just one small piece of it. Um, you know, how, the, how the, the person interacts with staff at a staff meeting or parents at an open microphone night or fourth grade students, which we've done in the past as well, have students interview um, the candidates. I mean, those are all important pieces of information when coming up with the final um, determination. Questions from the committee? A motion, Mr. Yeah. Robinson? I <clears throat> move to approve the screening process and timeline for the Joshua Eaton principal search. Second. Timeline. Second, thank you. Is there further discussion? I, I do. I, I, um, the process has changed slightly over, over my time on the committee. It used to be that a school committee member was present on that panel. I just want the community to know that school committee members are not on the um, panel for uh, screening candidates that then go to Dr. Doherty. Um, we get to approve the timeline, but we don't get to be on that committee, um, which is okay because if we're able to hire someone as successful as our last elementary principal, Mrs. Leonard, then we're doing okay. So We will, can I just? Of course, Mrs. Webb. Uh, we get, um, we'll have the schedule of any of the open mic nights. I know, Absolutely. right, so we always have the and we'll option. And we'll post that as a meeting as well. Okay. Okay. So that everyone can attend can from the committee. Okay. Yeah. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor of the motion? Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Thank you, Dr. Doherty. You're welcome. We got Mrs. Webb, we have eight minutes. Yeah. I, I, if I and, and I know. Oh, well, wait well, a minute. Mm -hmm. Cybert has some important information oh, that okay. she needs um, to share perfectly. about. Perfectly. Yeah. Perfect. No, that's perfect. Okay. I hope eight minutes is adequate or we'll figure out okay, okay. We'll talk fast. Um, uh, I did want to provide the school committee uh, and the public with an update on the um, asbestos that was discovered uh, last week at uh, Eaton um, so as you are aware the carpet that was in the school psychologist's office was soaked with water due to the roof leak um, that is a capital project the, leak, the roof will be replaced over the summer um, a school custodian removed the carpet and the floor tiles that were adhered to the carpet um, and uh, place that in the dumpster. Um, it was concerning because we do know that there was uh, asbestos in the mastic and in the tiles. Um, so upon notification that this had occurred, um, the contaminated area was secured and we uh, contacted Universal Environment Consultants, um, which is an air hygienist who came out um, and tested the area. Um, he tested the area in 14 different points in Eaton along the route that the custodian took to get the material out of the building. There was no asbestos found in any of those areas. The asbestos was contained just to that classroom. Um, so the samples that he tested were fine. Um, uh, like, sorry, oh, sure. not classroom. Not a classroom. Uh, oh, it's oh, an office. That's I'm sorry, really sorry. Okay. Yes, thank not you for correcting me. Not a classroom. Okay. But that small, a very small office, um, about 150 square feet. It's, it's very, very small. Um, the dumpster, a new dumpster was provided by JRM, 
uh, for the waste for the school during the day. Um, uh, that dumpster has been sealed and will be remediated, as will the office. Um, UEC, which is the company that we contracted with, the Universal Environmental Consultants, um, they submitted a plan to the DEP on Friday for uh, remediation. Um, it could take five to seven days for the DEP to approve that plan. Um, once that plan is approved, they estimate it'll take about five days to clear and clean, cleanse the office. Just that office? Excuse me, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. Five days to clean. Uh, well, they can't go in there until it, the plan is approved. Yeah. Okay, so not going to take them five days to do the work? Okay, good. That's what I thought. Potentially, yes. It's up to five days. They'll take as long as it needs to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because wow. it's a smaller square footage, it probably won't take probably five won't days. Take but, long, yeah. but, you know. I assume it can't happen. It can only happen when people are not in the building, so it has to be, yeah. yeah. Um, just want to reiterate that a message that went out, um, you know, at no time during uh, were students exposed. Um, in addition, no students have been in that office since um, prior to February vacation. Um, the asbestos is contained in the adhesive um, that was used to set the tiles to the floor, and it really, um, it's very difficult for it to become airborne. You'd have to grind it up. Um, and the facilities department is working in conjunction with our vendors and state regulators um, to respond very quickly and to mitigate any issues that there have been. Of course, Mr. Robinson. Uh, what about the employee who handled the ins How is that being addressed? I mean, that that person was exposed, right? Uh, custodian. The custodian. Is the workers' comp carrier handling that, or the the, the person that pulled up the tile? Yeah. Right. We we can certainly talk to you about that. Okay. Yeah. Is that personnel type issues? So it's not really something we can share, but I mean, the, he's, he's working. He's on duty. Was the staff member in the office? The staff member was they, not in the office. The uh, leak the was on the no, weekend, right? The weekend. Yeah, okay. And then the, then the carpet was, she probably wasn't in there when he was ripping up the carpet and the tile. No. no. <laughs> Small. Further questions from the committee? So how did, how did this get noticed? I'm just curious. Um, the uh, day custodian on Monday um, was aware that these buildings have old tiles and that potentially there was mastic or asbestos in the mastic and, uh, and raised a concern. So the office was sealed right away. And um, by 2 p.m., the uh, air hygienist was out in the school and, mm -hmm. and we knew. That's fantastic. Thank you. These are tiles that were they're previous to the renovation that occurred in the 90s these were the yes, yes. Um, there are there are schools in the district that do still have tile that has the adhesive has asbestos and those are properly documented and this is this is one of those areas thank you for that dr doxson i just wanted to say i'm continually amazed and impressed by how quickly those who are already very busy can turn on the need to get something done and get it done well and carefully. And I just wanted to say thank you because I know that plates are very full. So these things add another thing. And um, the students are first and the safety is first, and mm -hmm. that shows. And thank you. I did have two more things. Do I have You've only got two minutes. <laughs> I'm only kidding. You, uh, Dr. Doherty, is our guest here? I'll go look. Mm -hmm. Martha, please continue. Uh, so, um, Mr. Connery uh, mentioned earlier that there's a lot of snow outside, <laughs> and spring sports are just around the corner. And so, uh, last week, um, Ms. Cologne and Mr. Zaya had the opportunity to travel to Woburn to witness a piece of snow removal equipment that they had rented to um, clear their turf fields. And we thought it was in our best interest to secure the use of this equipment to address our turf fields. Um, which will help ready them for the uh, spring lacrosse season and it will also help free up the gymnasium so that not every single sports team is trying to use the gym for um, practice while we're there. So, um, so that was one quick thing. And then um, last Friday I was able to send out to the selection committee for the module classrooms. I just wanted to provide a, a quick update on that. So committee members in addition to Mr. Robinson, Ms. Colon and myself, are going to be Steve Bohannon, who is the district's licensed uh, electrician, 
and uh, uh, Joe Huggins, Mr. Joe Huggins, who is the former assistant director, or former director of our department, and he's the assistant director from DPW. So those will be the five members on the committee. Um, they have the timeline. The bid has been uh, available to the public since March 4th. Um, we've had four vendors um, take it. We thought there might be four or five vendors. Um, four have come forward and taken it. Uh, the site visits are on this Thursday, the walkthrough at all three sites. Um, so we're moving forward with that timeline, and uh, I don't foresee any um, concerns with, with staying with the, with the guidelines that I gave you last week. Awesome. Mrs. Webb. Do you expect that all four will show up for the site visits? I believe that's mandatory. They have the to if they want to bid, okay. yes. And you yeah. sort of expect that they will at this oh, we, juncture? Oh, we do, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Dr. Doxer? I'm not sure. Uh, what I wanted to ask, and I might already be supposed to know this, so forgive me, mm -hmm. but when a bid is accepted, it's not just on the lowest bid. It's the co a constellation of factors. Well, no, this is, um, we're, we're guided under Mass General Law, Chapter 149, modulars. <coughs> is actually a subsection for modular procurement. And the first step is going to be evaluate the proposals and figure out which is the best, which is the most advantageous proposal for the district. And then you negotiate price separately. So it's a two-step process. That makes me feel. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. That's Did it. Did you have further reports? Not me. That was it. No, just check it. That was um, We, uh, you have some field trips that you have to No, and I, uh, Dr. Billy, I just didn't know if our guest was okay waiting another ten minutes. five to ten minutes, or are we paying by the hour? <laughs> um, I, <laughs> that was yeah, I, I, Yes. Both. We're paying. But we can wait. Yeah. Oh, we're paying regardless. So we're yes. right. <laughs> Get a cup of coffee. Why don't we continue if that's okay? Um, I don't, I don't, I want to make sure that Mrs. Webb has enough time to give her report for the robotics team. Mrs. Webb, would you like to go now? I, I didn't mean to like build you up like that. Yeah. Can, yeah. Are I, we I, able to show that or not? I think it's a rather lengthy. All right. I, I don't. I can certainly send everyone. Tell us about okay. The weekend, I, Mr. All right. Webb. So, <laughs> well, it was an amazing event here at uh, Red Monroe High School. People don't know what first stands for. It stands for for inspiration and recognition of science and technology, um, and the New England. So it was a New England <clears throat> regional event here. John, how many teams were here? It was there were so, forty teams. About forty teams. The bleachers were full on both sides. There was nowhere to park. Well, we had the drama event on the, also here at the high school. Absolutely. And the 40 teams each had, they all, all get a certain uh, amount of square feet to set up their robots. And um, it was jam packed in there. And the field was set up. And obviously, you know, FIRST has a great, great set of technology systems to whole, run the whole event, which is incredibly impressive. It was actually really good Wi-Fi coverage. So whatever was done in the district to do Wi-Fi, you know, for this event was really appreciated. I know by the robotics team and uh, to watch the kids out there, the students, um, and if you r paid attention and watched Redding's team, it was the nail biter about whether they were going to get the robot onto the field for the last um, quarterfinal, I think. And I don't know if people have been to science team events before. Um, if you haven't, they are just as intense as a, any athletic thing you want, whether wrestling or football or swimming, down to the last touch. It's pretty impressive. And uh, I know Dr. Darty gave some opening remarks on Sunday morning, and they were just great. And I had uh, lots of people that kept coming up to me all day Sunday saying how inspiring that was. And I believe then Dean came and did close on Sunday evening. Was he, I was not here for the very close. Uh, both founders of FIRST came over the weekend, Woody Flowers and was Dean he, came I in. knew Woody was here, yeah. which is amazing. And to listen to the two of them speak, if you've never heard them speak, it's, it's uh, just stupendous. And really how committed they are um, to really, again, the inspiration of student learning and obviously this is focused in the areas of science and technology and uh, it was you know the people cheering and and uh, it was uh, Redding's team did just um, amazingly and yeah they had two times where it was like gosh are they gonna get to the field uh, and 
they, they made it. And so I know a, a lot of committee members, <coughs> several committee members were able to go. I was able to go. It, you, um, I, I will repeat your quote. It was as exciting as, and the field house was as packed for any of our sporting events. And it was really a cool atmosphere. A question, how were we able to get that to happen at the field house? Were they looking for a spot? Did so um, the, oh, uh, the parent group, um, uh, it was one of the goals. They've been in existence for three years now. Yep. So it was one of the goals of the team to host a regional. So they worked with New England first. Um, there were two local co-chairs, uh, Sanat Patel and Kyle Harris, I believe is his name. Um, and they, they coordinated the the event here. I mean, our facilities department worked with them very closely to make sure that everything was the way they wanted it. I mean, this has been this has been discussed for five months. Yeah, at least five or six months. Yeah. Um, it was it's so yeah. well done and uh, it's so well coordinated. Uh, there was um, Reading's police were here, you know, mm -hmm. with traffic, uh, and it was really a phenomenal way of showing off the high school. And the um, the parent group just you know it seemed like the last also the you know last week or two weeks leading up to it you know the emails were coming out like oh my gosh every parent needs to really help we, you know please sign up, and I think it all you know it, it went off great the food service in the cafeteria we I know a lot of groups for you know some of the bigger wrestling tournaments don't always use the calf it worked out great and on Sunday oh my gosh one in between the the end of the tournament and the uh, quarter quarterfinals, quarterfinals like. Yeah. 300 people came to the cafeteria for lunch. And we did really, everybody was like, wow, you guys, we're, we're thinking about doing this. We've been a little hesitant, but you guys seem to have it down pat. We're like, okay, looks, that's good. But So even like the, all the food and everything went, went great. Well, and Congratulations to everyone, because it really was yeah. a wonderful weekend. It was. So. And they, they make it, you know, it, sorry, it's, it, they really, it's on purpose, it's fun. You know, I mean, it was yeah. the music, and if you were there, the music was like our music. Um, but it was, it was, they, well, but it's... Our, our music. Well, right, my, my generation. Music, it was really more mine my than generation. yours, but that's okay. <laughs> but they really, it's on purpose to make it a really fun and engaging event and, um, you know, really just get p kids' energy up, and, and it is. The facility's perfect for it, too, really. It was great. Dr. Doxer? I just wanted to also congratulate the robotics team because um, they... Many of them, there were many awards given, um, and um, Chuck Strout, our math teacher here at the high school, was nominated for the Woody Flowers Award, um, Woody Flowers being one of the founders, and then Sanat Patel was given the Volunteer of the Year Award, and then the team was given the Entrepreneurship Award, which I just want to read what that means. Um, it means um, it celebrates the entrepreneurial spirit by recognizing a team that has developed the framework for a comprehensive business plan to scope, manage, and achieve team objectives. And that's like a great segue to say that this competition not only encourages kids to learn about robotics and the engineering, it also encourages them to work together as a team, to work with mentors. And all of the awards highlight different um, different skills and different priorities and they're not all about just science they're about um, one of the people from Lynn was saying to me it's the only competition she's ever gone to that would encourage teams to help another team Your that they're competing is, with right. so if someone's robot breaks the team in the pit next door might say what parts do you need how can we help you as opposed to yeah we're one up on them. They all collaborate and there are prizes for working together. Um, so I just really loved the whole spirit of the event. And they had a Lego table for younger kids to keep them engaged and interested. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you letting both. us indulge. No, that was very exciting. I will send you the link. Yeah, the link no. to the video. To the, to the video. Thank Videos. you. Videos. Thank Great. you. We have some field trips to approve this evening. Thank you very much. Yeah. <clears throat> Move to approve the RMHS Robotics Team Day field trips to Bryant University in Smithfield, Rhode Island on March 21st and 22nd. Second? Second. Discussion? Just that it's awesome they qualified. Just so, you, just so you, 
that you know this is another regional and it to determine if they go to the district level at WPI it's accumulation of scores and what happens both yesterday last week this past weekend and at this next event wonderful thank you Oh, I just had another comment okay. just um, thanks also because some of our staff like Dr. Darty and uh, Mr. Bakker rose to the challenge of being co uh, judges and that took a lot of time they had like minimum amount of our requirements for being doing different volunteer jobs so all of you that volunteered Mrs. Webb and others um, that was a lot of time and thank you for making this happen Further questions? All those in favor of the motion? 6 0, thank you. Mr. Robinson? Move to approve the RMHS Jazz Ensemble and Combo Field Trip to UNH on March 14th. Is there a second? Can I make a comment? Mr. Knight. So, uh, just not to be a stickler, but I know we, we talked about a, a 1 to 10 ratio. In some of these, the, the, the uh, robotics one is great. There's plenty of parents going to that. And this is like just barely, it's 22 students and two teachers. It's there are plenty of parents far. going to this as well. All right. So it would be, I think. He, it just was not captured on yeah. the sheet. So just just for, I'm thinking from a legal standpoint, you know, if we ever got called on it, you know, I don't know if we need to have the documentation on paper or just the documentation that they're there. Yeah, I think what makes this, I mean, this is a, this is a jazz band festival. Yeah. So they, they are playing at different times and there are parents that stay the entire day. Yeah. So I just I just would feel more comfortable if that was stated on the on the application that we knew there was going to be more parents than that, and then I would think the same thing would be the case on the uh, lacrosse. lacrosse. Yeah. Again, it's a scrimmage. So they go, they play the scrimmage, and yeah. then they, yeah. and we don't have. I mean, if it was in Massachusetts, we don't have that ratio. I know. I know. I mean, you, I was we, thinking about because usually it's we have just two coaches. It's out of state, right. I noticed uh, the wrestling. Uh, team was doing their scrimmage on uh, an event too. They did have more than enough coaches, but I just wanted to qualify that. Thank you, Mr. Knight. Further discussion? Ready to vote on the motion. All those in favor? Opposed? The motion carries 6-0. <coughs> and move to approve the RMHS boys lacrosse trip to Exeter, New Hampshire on March 28th to play against Exeter High School. Second? Second. Conversation? Seeing that, all those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 6 0. Thank you. We have some donations. Move, move to accept the donation in the amount of $400 from the Silicon Valley Community Fund grant program as part of an employee match from Mrs. Webb. Is there a second? Second. Thank you very much, Mrs. Webb. Welcome. Discussion? Robotics team. Ready for the vote? 6 0. Thank you. Move to accept a donation in the amount of two hundred dollars from the Silicon Valley Community Fund grant program as part of an employee match from Ms. Webb. Is there a second? Second. Great. All those in favor? I don't know. I can vote. You can vote all you want. Uh, yeah. Probably not, actually. But yeah, I might. Uh, move, move to accept a donation in the amount of twelve hundred dollars from Mr. and Mrs. John Halsey to be used to offset the cost of the Rob Surratt artwork as part of the Martin Luther King Day celebration. Wow. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Doctor. I'd just like to thank you reported on the this. Halseys. Um, so that will be um, a couple of portraits for the town, and then there'll also be. Um, two other portraits coming to the high school, one of Einstein and um, of Mother Teresa to join the other ones, but they won't be in the Library Media Center necessarily. Excellent. So Thank you. He was inspired by the event. That's awesome. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Uh, move to approve the financial forum minutes date dated January 21st, 2015. Second. Is there a second? Discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Motion carries 6 0. Mr. Robinson? Move to approve the open session minutes dated February 24th, 2015. Thank you. All those in favor? Great. Um, I want to just re um, remind the committee that we are scheduled for FinCom 
7.30 Wednesday night at Town Hall. Looking forward to seeing everyone there. Dr. Dobson. Did you want other reports now or are we coming back afterwards? No, we're not. We're not going to come back afterwards. So let's have our reports. I, I'm sorry. Reports? Dr. Dobson. So just a quickie. Um, the Human Relations Advisory Committee um, met, and I will just be very quick on it. Um, we're planning a subsequent, we're working with the Winchester Multicultural Network on a um, Take a Stand Against Racism Day that's planned for a round, somewhere around April 24th. Um, and we're planning to do something within the town as well. And we're looking for people that want to work with us on that. People can choose to um, be a part of our committee. We're looking for people to be on the Human Relations Advisory Committee, but also we're looking for those people who just want to work on events um, and be a part of the great action. It's very fun. And um, I think the other things we can, oh, the um, Martin Luther King Day event is on our, our CTV's YouTube station now. So if you want to see it, not with Rob Surrett's piece, but all of the community presentations are on there. And thank you again to everybody that participated. Other committee reports this evening? No. No. Mr. Robinson. Move to go into executive session to conduct energy, to conduct strategy to, with respect to litigation and approval of the minutes not to return to open session. The roll call vote. Mrs. Browski? Yes. Mr. Nine? Yes. Mr. Robinson? Yes. Dr. Doctor? Yes. Mrs. Webb? Yes. Mr. Crusoe? Yes. yes.